First, thanks to B&H for having us here. Um, this actually, this photograph's taken, and, and for those of you who have not been to B&H Photo, um, as you're looking online, B&H is actually right below the B&H logo right there. Like, we're literally at B&H. So this is the corner of heaven and camera. So corner of heaven and camera is B&H right there. So it's my favorite place to be. I remember I actually came on my honeymoon to New York City, and uh, one of the places my wife took me uh, on my honeymoon was to B&H Photo. So that's how important this store has been to me for my whole life. So I, I actually came here on my honeymoon, which is a little weird, I suppose. But um, And then, of course, uh, thanks to Profoto um, for bringing me here and putting on this, uh, this course, this lesson today. Um, I, I couldn't survive without Profoto. Um, just fantastic flash, fantastic equipment, fantastic lighting. And so um, we are going to be talking about the concept of lighting um, and light in general because obviously that's what photography uses as its medium, right? You use light. What would happen if you didn't have light to photograph? You would have nothing, right? Yeah, so uh, my, my favorite statement um, is this one here. I've heard this said a lot, and, and people find it as this cool catchphrase. Photography, it's all about the light, it's all about the light. And that's the dumbest statement I've ever heard in my entire life, because of course it's all about the light. So is seeing. If you didn't have light, you couldn't see, and we'd also all freeze to death if we didn't have light, because the sun would be gone, and we would all die, and the planet would be a frozen ball like Jupiter or, or Pluto or something like that, right? So, so light obviously is what we use, in our medium, the same way that photog or that writing is all about the words. So to say that photography is all about light is the same as saying writing is all about words, which also is a very dumb statement because of course it's all about words because you have to have you words in order to write something in order to make a statement. So I thought it would be interesting um, to. Show, this is one of my favorite books, Voltaire. Anybody read Voltaire? Okay, love Voltaire. Great, great, uh, or Candide, sorry. Voltaire wrote Candide. Um, so anyway, this is a uh, quote from Candide. And this is the quote. It says, she blushed and so did he. She greeted him with a flattering voice and he spoke to her without knowing what he was saying. Do you get the feeling of that moment? When, they, when they're together, and they just, they're so in love that they don't know what to say, and they don't even know what they're saying, right? That's, that's a fantastic way to say this. Now, Vol this is not Voltaire, right? This is my version of it. So, when we are photographing, we can either speak like... Voltaire, and we can say that she blushed, and so did he. And she greeted him in a faltering voice, and, her, and he spoke to her without knowing what he was saying. Or we can say they really liked each other. Do you see the difference? And it's all about light. How we talk as photographers how the language we use is light. That's the language we use. And we can say it in a very boring way, where we have no beautiful sky, and we don't have any real volume to the person, and we're not really accentuating the, the lines and the undulations of the sand. Or we can show it with depth, and we can show it with clouds, and we can show it with drama. So that's what Voltaire did to my very boring book about two lovers that really liked each other. And it's all about the light and the way we place the light and what we do with the light that determines the beauty of the story that we're telling. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about how we get light to not only do things, but also to say things. So in every photograph that I show you today, I want you to think about what is the light doing 
in the photograph and what is the light saying in the photograph because there is a big difference between the two concepts. And if you look around, even if you're, how many of you shoot natural light, you just wander around and take pictures, you, okay, so you're either artists or you like street photography or you like landscape photography, stuff like that, right? So, you can go out on a bright sunny day at noon and it's kind of boring light and you don't get anything interesting or you can wait for your landscape shot until 5 o'clock in the evening or 4.30 in that sweet light. And then all of a sudden, it starts singing, right? It starts saying something brilliant and beautiful because the shadows are longer and because there's certain highlights on certain buildings and, and other buildings are in shadow. And all of a sudden, you've got this really beautiful message being said. Whereas at noon, it's kind of boring. But at noon, you could go into the shadows of these buildings and get some very beautiful portraits and you can get some very beautiful images with you know highlights coming across through the streets in New York City because one one street is in shadow and the other one is fully lit and like there's so much cool interplay and there's there's reflections off of buildings that are kind of dappling through another street and going through like the 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 leaves of the trees and so there's a lot of opportunities but it just depends on where you are and what time you take that photograph, right? Okay, so as a, as a photographer that's not using flashes, you're still doing the same thing. So just because we're not going to be using a flash when we're taking a picture does not mean that we're not considering the same concepts. I just happen to sometimes create my light. In fact, 95% of the time, I'm creating light because the light that I have isn't necessarily all that great because I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, and it is bright, bright, bright sunlight all the time, okay? We don't have clouds like you guys have them. So on a cloudy, it's funny because I had an assistant who, um, who would work with me at weddings, and, and brides always mistakenly think that if it's cloudy on their wedding day, it's gonna be bad for pictures. And they get worried. They're like, oh, is this going to be OK? Are we gonna? And, I'm, and I tell them, are you kidding me? I ordered these specifically for you. I prayed to God and asked for clouds today, and he brought them. So like, this is beautiful, the fact that we have clouds. Um, but I have an assistant that would always come to weddings, and, and, and he, he works for lots of different photographers. And he said to me one day, he said, I don't understand it, but it seems like every time I do a wedding for you, there's clouds. <laughs> And then everybody else I shoot for, there's no clouds. He says, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, I'm just living right, I guess, because I'm always getting clouds. So, but it's only, you know, very rarely do we have clouds. And we never have rain. So I think we get two inches a year of rain. So, yeah, think about that. Two inches of a, year, a year. So light says things and it does things. And we're going to talk about that right now. So this is a perfect example. So can anyone tell me what light is doing in this picture? There's very specific things that the light is doing. It's, an, it's a tool. Yeah? Okay, well, it's giving backlights of her hair. There's something up front that's lighting their faces. Okay, so that the, also doing the seats. So the, the backlight, this light here is rimming her hair and his hat because if it wasn't, his hair and his hat would fall right back into there and we wouldn't see them. It would just disappear. So that rim light is really important to create the shape of his head against the background, which is also dark. And also you know that it's giving rim light to all of the seats and therefore we know that there are seats. Without this light, without this background light, the seats would not exist because all we would have is darkness and we would have no indication that there are seats, and we'd also have no indication of how deep the theater is. We might think it's a mile deep, we might think it's just, you know, there might be a flat black wall behind them. There's nothing to give us any indication of depth. So, light that's coming from behind your subject creates depth. <clears throat> Same way that if you're photographing a landscape and the sun is setting over there, you know, and you're facing the sun and it's coming towards the camera, your landscape becomes deep 
because it's got highlight, shadow, highlight, shadow, highlight, shadow coming towards the camera. And all those long shadows of trees are coming towards the camera. And that creates converging shadows like this, which creates this feeling of, of depth. Okay, so we get all of these beautiful lines coming towards us, which lead us into the background, and we have depth, and that's what we have here. You can see all those converging lines that are coming, all of that as a result of one thing, that back light. Okay, there's obviously another light in the situation that's up here somewhere, and it's forward light, and what is that light doing? Okay, it's giving us shape to the face, it lights up her eyes so that we can see her eyes. And, and the forward light is always the thing that gives us some kind of, of sparkle in the eyes. It's the thing that gives us eye color, right? So for right now, what's your name? Chin. Chin, nice yeah. to meet you, I'm Jared. Chin, what color are your eyes? What, what color, are they brown? Hazel. They're hazel? Yeah. Okay, they look completely black right now. Yeah because I'm in the dark. Because you don't have a forward light. Yeah. If I turned a forward light on Chen, I would see that he has hazel eyes. Now I can see, what's your name? Louisa. Louisa. I can see that Louisa has kind of a hazel eye as well, right? Yeah. But I can only see that because there's a little bit of forward light that's coming down on her from these, this light right here. That's the light that's giving me something on her. But I don't get to see it on you until you, now that you lean back, I can start to see it. So it's that forward light that gives us sparkles in the eyes. It lets us know that she has blue eyes. It gives a shape to her face. That's what that light does. Now, what does the light in the background say? Because it says something. What does it say? Projector. Word of movie. That's the projector coming forward and, and just telling us the story, right? What is the foreground light? What does our front light say? What's that? Subjects. Okay, it says subjects, it what? No, I was thinking it's the screen. It's the screen. We all, there's all light coming towards us in a movie theater, right? And so all of these lights are telling us we're in a theater, but not just we're in a theater because there are seats, but there's literally light coming from the projector screen, and there's light coming from the projector. None of this is real. That's a flash stuck up where the projector would be, because you'd be surprised projectors are very dim. They don't actually provide a lot of light, so you have to put a flash where the projector is in order to get that kind of a shot. So we hoisted the light way up here to get that shot. And then, you know what this light is? It's me like this with my flash pointed back on the screen, which is, what is it, in 90 feet or something like that? So it's a very soft, beautiful light. And those projector screens are very reflective. And so you get a lot of light. It's a two light setup. There's just simply two lights. One of them is pretending to be the projector and it's doing something and it's saying something. And one of them is my flash on my camera pounding at that screen, which is doing something and saying something. See how I'm thinking when I'm, when I'm setting up a photograph? Okay, so Ansel Adams this is one of my favorite quotes. And it is, the photographer is only successful to the extent that he can hide his hand. So we're only really successful as photographers if we can get you to believe that you're looking through a window at something that is real. Because once you think it's fake, then we're no longer successful at getting you to uh, be angry about a subject, getting you to be happy, getting you to buy a product, all of those things. If you recognize that the car that they're putting on the advertisement never existed because it's just a virtual reality car that they built inside of a, in a computer studio, and then they put it on a road that doesn't actually exist, it's harder to believe that you want that car. So they have to make it look real. The more real they can make it look, the more likely you are to buy it. And also, the more they put people in the shot and, and you know they're going out to dinner or they're driving around with their family or whatever, the more they can make it real and hide their hand to make it look like you're viewing into reality. You're peeking through a window at reality. That's when photography becomes useful. That's when it becomes powerful. 
I remember several years back, there was a photograph um, that was, uh, it, was a, it was a photograph that was a journalistic photograph of, I don't remember what <coughs> war-torn country it happened to be, but it, there was bombings that were happening there, and they were trying to suggest that there was more uh, destruction than there really was. And this photographer had his photograph published where he had gone into Photoshop and he had replicated the cloud, the, the puffs of smoke. Mm -hmm. Do you remember this photograph? I don't remember exactly which t country it was in, but anyway, he had, he had Photoshopped extra clouds of smoke from fires, so it looked like, I think it was Beirut, maybe. Anyway, so, he, so Beirut's on fire, and he wants it to look like it's really on fire, and so he's got like 15 puffs of smoke, but they all look the same, because mm. he wasn't very good at Photoshop. I could have done a much better job than this guy did. He, was a com he should have been fired just because he was really bad at Photoshop. <laughs> but anyway, he creates these puffs of smoke, and because everybody could see that they were replicated puffs of smoke, clearly it was a lie. As soon as that lie happened, people stopped believing anything coming out of that country. Because who believes that it's really on fire? Who believes the war is really that bad if you have to lie about it to get me to believe that? And so people stopped believing, and they had to fire the guy, obviously, but they really had to do some damage control because they had a lying photographer. So. We have to be as truthful as possible when we're telling a story, otherwise you'll stop believing it. Now, I don't have to be truthful because I, I don't do any uh, journalistic type stuff. I, I take documentary shots at a wedding, but guess what? I'm paid by the wedding couple to make them look better. So I shoot from better angles, I make sure that they're lit well. Like I have the greatest job because I can lie all day long and make people look amazing and it's okay. People pay me to lie. So, but the lie still has to be believable because I'm only successful if I can hide my hand. If I look like I'm over retouching or if I look like I'm taking someone who was 300 pounds and making him 98 pounds, that's a big lie, right? I can't do that. So I have to be careful about the lies that I tell and tell them in a way that you can't tell that I'm lying. So, as we look at photography and as we take pictures of things, and in this case I'm taking pictures of children running through you know, the grass, I have to do it in a way that's really beautiful and it sells the idea, but I have to do it in a way that hides my hand so that you don't know how hard I was working on the scene. And in this case, the, the beautiful sun-kissed uh, light that's coming through those little wheat strands and their hair and they're running, that's a flash. That's just a flash off to the left hand side of the frame, so it's just right off, uh, off the camera left here, and it's just coming across and what is it doing? It's creating shape so that his hair doesn't fall into the background of the photograph and get him lost because otherwise there would be no depth and his head would be the same as those trees in the background. So I create a rim light by just throwing a, photo, a, a, a light back there and actually at the time, this was taken before the A1 existed. If, it was, if the A1 had existed back then, I would have just thrown a little A1 flash on a stand and that would have done all the work for me. But instead it's a B2 back there and it's just sitting in the background and it's just popping light and I'm just saying go play and run through the, you know, and they just keep running around and I'm taking pictures of them and this is one of the photographs. So it's literally just one light because the sun is doing the rest of the work. The sun is creating the ambient light in the forest and all I need to do is provide that little kiss of light that creates all of these wonderful little uh, specular highlights on the, the wheat strands and also on their hair to kind of separate them. So in this case, I know that this is going to be the smoking lounge for the, the wedding, and I know that there's going to be opportunities to get pictures of smoke flying and, and the groomsmen smoking and all that kind of stuff. So I simply set up lights in order to create the opportunity, but I'm, I want it to feel natural, and it just looks like they're in a place where light is coming down, but this is outside in the darkness. There's no light out here, none to speak of, 
especially none that I could freeze smoke plumes and things like that. So I light the background and then I just use an on-camera flash to barely light forward so that I actually get some detail in his face. But the strong lights are coming from the back, coming forward, because that's how we get this. You only get smoke plumes if you have light coming through the smoke towards the camera. That's how you get those. You don't get them by pushing light forward onto them. And so you need the strongest light to come through those smoke plumes. So you've got to think ahead in order to come up with opportunities like that. So you know this is going to exist. And now we're going to create light that will help to sell that story, to tell the story that we want to tell. But it's the light that's telling the story. Just like the words, the proper words put in the proper order make the story more enjoyable. This story would not be at all enjoyable to watch if it was just an on-camera flash going forward onto them, or if it was just me jacking up my ISO at an event and just hoping that the ambient light was going to hit them decently. This would not be as beautiful a story to tell. I wouldn't get to see all of this. I wouldn't get all the texture. I wouldn't get all of the rim lights. It would just be a boring story. So the light is the words you're using. Now, in some cases, you're dealing with a much easier circumstance. You don't have to do a lot out here. This is um, just outside of Salt Lake City um, is the great salt flats, which are just basically deposits of salt that are very flat. Um, but the beauty of the salt flats is that there's light bouncing everywhere. And so it's very easy to take the photograph. However, there is still a shadow on this side of the kid's face. On the right-hand side of the kid's face, there is a shadow. And that shadow can be very deep, especially out in the desert. Salt Lake City is in the desert. Um, and there's, a, there's the sun, which is setting over to the left of the camera. And that's a pretty bright, setting sun. And so that right-hand side of his face would be a little bit too deep a shadow. And so in order to fix that, we need a light in the mix in order to kind of s fill in those shadows. So sometimes when we're lighting, we are using light to say things. We're telling a story with the light. We're separating things out with the light. We're using background lights to bring things forward. We're creating volume by doing cross lighting. We're doing a lot of things with light to sell a story. But sometimes we're just fixing problems because the problem of the shadow is too deep. And so we need to fill in that shadow slightly. And we're just fixing those little problems. Because otherwise, the photograph is perfect. So I love the photograph, but I just needed a little fill in the shadow, a little bit of fill here in the shadow of that little whatever, that classic pedal bike thing, whatever that is. Anyway, that's an amazing thing. It didn't work, actually. So we just set it there. It was funny because they had two of them. One worked and the other one didn't. And then we would have races and the little kid would try and pedal this one and he'd get so frustrated because that one didn't work. But all we wanted was the photograph. And so the kid is super angry that his isn't working. <laughs> and the other one's zipping by. But it was great for the photograph. So we had a great time with the photographs. Um, other times, and in this case, this is a job that I did for the Phoenix Symphony. Um, in other times, we are selling a big, big lie with the lighting. So in this case, um, you can see that we had a task of photographing all of our symphony orchestra uh, members in various places in Phoenix to show kind of the, you know, the, the, the city and the vibrance of the city and, you know, different things about the city. So we're kind of in the middle of the desert. So we've got city and then desert, mountains right in the city. And so it's very unique. So we had, you know, uh, orchestra members out in the desert next to the mountains. And then we had them in the city next to the light rail and all that kind of stuff. And uh, by the way, Arizona, Phoenix is very proud that we have a light rail system because we wanted to be like New York. <laughs> But it turns out that this is the dumbest system on the planet because it only has one line that goes in an L through a three or 400 square mile city. So you really can't get, you have to drive to the light rail and then take the light rail somewhere as opposed to just 
leave your apartment building and get on the, mm -hmm. <laughs> so your subway is much cooler than our light rail. So anyway, but we're very proud of the fact that we're metropolitan, we have this light rail, so they want one next to light rail. The problem is Phoenix hosted the final four this last year. And when the final four came into town, I went to get permits to photograph in various places in Phoenix. Couldn't do it because Homeland Security takes over when, the, when big events come. You have to get permission from them to do your photography. Couldn't do it. So then I asked, I said, well, what if I was just wandering around with a tripod and a camera? And they said, oh, well, then you're just a tourist. Go knock yourself out. So I wandered around, and I took all of these photographs here, and then I had to drop the people into the photographs. Now, now comes the <coughs> selling the lie. I have to pretend that the person is there. So in every photograph, I look at the light that exists in the photograph and ask myself, how would it be lit if the person was standing there? So if you look on the right side of his face, there's quite a shine on the right side of his face. It looks like it's coming from where? From these lights up here on the right-hand side of the photograph, but it's not. It's coming from my flash. My flash is put right in the right spot, so I have a two by three softbox that is pa facing the camera like this, and it is lighting him right here in order to create that light. So as we um, try and sell the lie, we are specifically looking for places the light would naturally come from, and we're adding it from that direction. And that's how we sell the lie, is by the light. Now the angle matters, but the light matters more because your eye can see where light should come from. And if it's not in the right places, your eye will notice, your brain will figure it out. And then it will find something wrong. It'll say, that doesn't look right if the light's not right. Okay? So, now, this is another favorite quote of mine from Abraham Lincoln. He says, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first four sharpening the ax. So if he has a sharp ax, that tree comes down quickly. If he has a dull ax, he'll spend a lot more time than he needs to. So, but in the end, if he sharpens his ax, not only does he get a tree, but he also has a nice sharp ax at the end as well. So what I wanna do is I wanna teach you by sharpening your ax, we wanna talk about photography and lighting um, because we wanna show you how to fix problems how to build lighting scenarios, um, and how to tell your story, how to, how to really create your story based on the light that you see. So I want you to think, every time you see a photograph that I show you, I want you to think, how, why was it lit that way? What is, the, what is the light doing, and what is it saying, and why did he choose to put the light in that place? And I'm gonna show you how the light was done. So for instance, in this scenario, um, we wanted this dark, brooding, rainy, thing and this is this is how we lit that and it truly was raining and so you can see that I've got like plastic baggies over my lights to try and keep them so these are just plastic parkas that you get like at SeaWorld or whatever when you go to if Shamu's gonna splash you well that, that's just a bunch of parkas over things um, I've got a umbrella over my camera here and then here's the model over here, and we've got two lights on this scene. But notice that it's not actually dark outside, it's light outside. I just simply underexposed my ambient, so the ambient is just giving a little bit of the work. It's doing the, the general stuff, like giving me something on the bridge, giving me something in his coat, giving me something in the background. But the main work is being done by a two by three softbox, this right here, and uh, a backlight here with a magnum reflector on it so that it got lots of power coming from it and it's directed and this light is giving me that rim light and separating him out from the darkness and this light is giving me the shape of his face and so now when you look at that photograph you can see there's so the the rim lights coming from over there and then the soft light is what's creating the shape on his face and giving me that beautiful light yeah 
you need to use high speed sync for that to get the background dark enough? No, it was cloudy enough that I was able to just, that one's probably, and I'm just kind of guessing right now, but it's probably at like low ISO, so that's 50 ISO, um, and then probably at 200th of a second, and then maybe at, you know, F, you know, five or five, six or something like that, that probably was sufficient to darken it down enough. Um, so you could have gone into high speed sync if it was a brighter day, but fortunately it was a really dim, dim day. That was one of the few days and we never expect rain. And so I go out and I'm expecting just kind of this dark brooding clouds, but we got dumped on. Um, that was an experience because that literally my, my I, uh, some of the water got into my B, that was a B1 flash, yeah. it blew up. Because water got into it and it just went So fortunately I had another B1, so we put that one on and covered it a little bit better and had to have it repaired, so yeah. So flashes don't like to work in this. So I'm not recommending that you flash in the uh, rain. But if you cover them well, then they work just fine. But I, the first one wasn't covered well enough, so. Okay, so I want to go through, and this is fairly a casual uh, exercise here, so I'm, I'm going to go through some shots, and we're going to talk about lighting those shots and how they were done and why we th I was thinking the way I was thinking so that you get a feel for the idea behind lighting photographs because it's all about the story you're trying to tell. You're trying to sell something and the lighting is what's doing it. So I'm gonna start with some, some, well here, this is an interesting one because this is my, this is early, early, early on in my career. And I just, I was looking for photographs that I wanted to show you and then I realized that I've been doing the same concept um, since this is like almost 12 years ago. Um, and I've been, I've been following that same methodology for a very, very long time, even though I didn't know I was following it. Um, and the methodology is this. You will always work harder with less uh, effect. You'll be worse at your job and you'll work harder if you try and fight light. The natural existing light is there to serve you and help you. And if you try and fight it, it's going to cost you batteries, it's going to cost you in power, and it's going to cost you in frustration, and you're still not going to do as good a job. And time. So what I do is I follow naturally occurring light. So I walk into a scene like this and I see that there is light here. There's light over here as well, but there's a window over here. There's, so the natural light would come this way. And so I simply added my flash up here and started moving this way with the flash. So this is a very early piece of work and I just thought it was interesting. I wanted to show it to you because uh, it, it shows the same methodology even back a long time ago. And so now I'm going to go into another scenario where you can see clearly where the light comes from. So this is much later in my career. Um, on the edge of the Grand Canyon, and you can see that the sun on the, on the camera of the left, left camera, is setting. So the natural uh, light comes from the left and goes to the right. Most people make a mistake, and that is that when they see the light coming this way, they take a flash and try and fill the shadow from over here. So now you're trying to compete with the sun. You can't do it. The sun is much brighter than you are, right? You would have to have seriously, like real serious power to overcome the sun. We can, we can match the sun, but overcoming the sun is very difficult. But if you try not to overcome the sun and just work with it and come from the same side as the sun, now you don't have to work as hard. And you get more real, realistic natural lighting patterns. So, I've got a sun coming from the left and going to the right. It's already cresting on, his, on the flowers and it's cresting on the collar. It's coming across his, his face there. You can see it across her chest. You can see it down here on her torso. Like you can see that light already happening, but without the light, it's gonna be too dark on their face. It's gonna be really in shadow. So I simply have, and in this case, it's a two by three softbox. It's this little OCF softbox on a B1 head. And I'm simply holding that, well, I'm not holding it. My assistant is holding it right off here. And it's 
following the sun. So it's coming from the same direction, but now the light is this big instead of that big. And so the, the sun's light is creating the harsh shadows, and my light is pretending to be the sun. It's coming from the same position as the sun, and it's just sneaking around their face a little bit further, so it's making it appear as the sun just as a bigger light source. But all the light's coming from the same place. And you'll notice in my work that no matter what I do, I'm always taking the light from the same place. And I'll give you a, a, an example of building light here. So this shot here that was uh, shot in Barcelona, you can see where the light's coming from, correct? It's coming from this light source and it's coming down on her. And there's another, there's going to be another can of, you know, another uh, sconce over here somewhere and up here somewhere. And so you can see where the light source is coming from. But that's not actually what the scene looks like. This is what the scene actually looks like. It was shot during the day. This was not on. In fact, there wasn't even a light in there. So I couldn't have waited and have it turn on later. It was just kind of an empty, you know, sconce for a light. So, but this is what the scene looks like. So what I did is I saw in my head, I pre-visualized a shot and said, well, I really want it to be dark like this. So I want to have a dark area and then I want that light to be on and I want the light to look like it's coming from that light. So at that point, I do this. So I put a B1 head up here with a deep silver umbrella. So it's casting light down, but it's right off scene just right off to the left hand side of the frame so that you can see the light would come from that same general direction. Obviously the, the sconce with the light is behind her, but that's okay because we can, we can believe the lie if it's just sneaking around a little bit further. So we just pull it around a little bit further, a little bit forward, just like we would the sun. There's no difference between this shot and a sunny day. That's the sun. It's coming from over there, so that means the light is also going to come over from there. And we would, if this was actually on, it would create rims on her, but it wouldn't create enough light in the front of her face. So we would just simply sneak it around the front, and that's going to give us the light on the front of the face, and it's going to light her body here. And then we're going to put another head, a bare head, nothing modifying it over behind her around the corner basically because we could assume another light might be on the other side and that's what is doing something that's what's creating the rim light in order to make it believable that a it's a light source and b we don't have her fall into the background here because otherwise her hair is too dark and she would fall into the background so both of these lights are doing something they're lighting her in the darkness and they're saying something. The light, the, the umbrella light is saying that it is the light from the sconce, and the other light is saying that it is the light coming from something else. It's separating her out, and it's creating that warm glow from a natural street lamp that's not actually there. So, it doesn't mean that you have to think only when you walk into a scene, what is the light naturally doing now? and how can I follow it? But you can also think, what would the light naturally be doing if I had this, that, or the other scene, this, the, if something was going on in this scene? Because sometimes, most of the time, I find that the natural occurring light is more boring than I could make it. And so I will, I will fix the natural light. Okay, so let's go. Here's a great, uh, hold on, where did that go? Okay, so here's a really great example of that. This is just fixing a problem. The problem is, is that I, it's bright, 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 bright sunlight. If I take her out onto an open field, it is going to be ugly light. It's probably noon. It's going to be glaring off of her hair, which is blonde, which makes it very difficult. I need to control the light somehow. 
So in this case, I simply take her into the shadow of like a little grove of trees. So now she is completely in shadow. There's nothing on her, no light on her. But you can see in the background that there's shimmering light through the trees because the light is coming down between the trees and creating something in the background. But you can see the trees that are in the background. The problem is, is that if I don't light her, she's just going to be a shadow under some trees. So in this case, I have two lights. And those two lights are going to fix the problem of the shadow. The first light is, again, just a 2 by 3 softbox. So it's that nice soft light. But where is the sun coming from? You can look there and you can see it. It's coming, yeah, that's right. It's coming from up in the right-hand corner of the frame. So you can see where the light is happening. And so where do I put the light? I put it on the right-hand side of her face. And you can see that it's off to the right. And as a result of that, the shadow on her nose is towards the camera because it looks like the, the light from the sun is what's hitting her. And it's hitting her from the left-hand side coming forward. And it's coming towards the camera. So we set it to the side enough that it creates a shadow going the same direction that the sun would naturally create. But I also need it to look like the sun is hitting her. So a softbox isn't going to cut it. The softbox just lights her face and her jacket and her hands, and it does a great job. But I need specular highlights in her hair if I want you to think that that, see the specular highlights behind her? Those specular highlights behind her are because the sun is a very small light source, and it's pounding down, and, and that's water back there. And so <laughs> it's like, you know, because the, the uh, grove is being watered at the moment. And so that specular, it's bouncing off of the, the water. So I need something to make her glow and rim light her and sparkle in her hair because that's what the sun would do. So I have this light, a little, a little B2, wrapped around a tree, right? So it's wrapped around a tree with, I think that's called a, I don't know. A bogo, a, a jo, jobo, I don't know, something like that. Anyway, it's just, it's just one of those little tripods that you can like bend around. So I keep that with me and I can just, I can put my little B1 anywhere on the planet because I have that with me and I wrap it around telephone poles, I lap, wrap it around, set it up on things, wrap it around car doors, whatever I need to set it somewhere to create that kind of natural sunlight. Okay, so that's a, that's a B2. Not a B1, a B2. B, B1 is much heavier. It wouldn't, it wouldn't hold up on that. That's the beauty of the B2 is that it's a very light head, and it's got a cord that comes down to the power pack. So the power pack can be down at the ground, and the head can be way up in a tree, or it can be up on a, like, Tether Tools uh, company, um, actually, that is in Phoenix, but uh, they sell stuff here in B&H. Tether Tools makes all sorts of little clamps and stuff. So I have tons of little clamps that I can clamp to a door jam, or I can uh, put on a wall, things like that, that will help me to secure very light things like this wherever I need them to be. So, so that's where that light is coming from. So her hair is being lit by that B2 head up in a tree, kind of clinging onto it with that bogo or whatever that's called. Okay. Um, so here's, here's a really great example of following light. Now this one is very challenging because um, we, we have to do two things with this one. So we have to somehow, the, the sun is really, 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 really bright. You can see how dark the shadows are in uh, on the right hand side, you see how dark those shadows are? So those shadows are the natural shadows and highlights that you would get in the scene if you just took the picture. So they would be in very deep shadow and they would have lots of ugly like shadows and lights across them. So we have to somehow light them, but before we light them we have to remove the ugly shadows that exist on them. Because the sun is created, it's really harsh sun. So this is how I do that and this is, this is Basically, what you're doing is you're going to remove the light, and then you're going to relight it the same way the sun would light it, except with a bigger light source. So this is what we did. So this is a, the extra large translucent pro photo umbrella. And so my assistant just holds it, and that is shadowing their bodies. 
So we remove the light so that we don't have any problems with the light. And then we just simply take a softbox. It's another 2x3 softbox. That's actually the RFI, so it's a little heavier than that one. Um, but softbox with a B1, and that B1 is what's going to light them. But now, instead of a little tiny sun lighting them, it's a big flash lighting them that's going to make it soft light. But it's coming from the same general direction. It's, again, the sun is coming from the right-hand side of the frame. And so we put the light on the right-hand side of the frame in order to match or follow the light that naturally exists. And so this is what it looks like, like that. So this light is lighting them and then that is shading them. So we shade them and light them. And if, a lot of, if you're doing a portrait out in the sun, it's very easy to take a light, um, take a, a large umbrella, and use the large umbrella to block the sun, but have a flash in the umbrella and have it flash. And now the sun's coming and getting blocked, and the light is coming from the same place as the sun, but now it's this big. So you've done two things at once. You block the sun and light from the same position, and now you have this beautiful light coming from the sun. It, it works better when you're shooting just like a smaller portrait, because you can see that I can see all of my stuff. So that's the only problem with this shot, is that I got all this stuff in the way. So what I did is I shot the photograph, and as soon as I liked what I had, I just told everybody, okay, now get out of the way. So all those guys all got out of the way, and I just merged the shot. So I took all of the stuff from the right-hand side and put it on in Photoshop. So if I'm in a situation where I've got to solve a problem, but I'm doing a big, wide shot, sometimes it's easier to get that light closer, because you'll get a lot more power out of it, um, especially with a B1 or a B2. Um, <clears throat> In Phoenix, Arizona, not when it's cloudy, but when it's bright sun, um, the further you get away from them, the harder that flash has to work to get through that modifier. And so sometimes it's not powerful enough. So the closer you get, you get two advantages the closer you get. The first advantage is that the light gets softer because it's getting relatively bigger in comparison to them. So that's the first advantage, which I love. But the second advantage is that it's more powerful as I step forward. So I always bring my light in as close as I possibly can because I get the power and I get the softness of the light. So the, the question is, how did I get that light to appear as though it is um, being lit? And that was done, this is still, you're looking at a raw image. So I haven't taken this into Photoshop yet. It's still a raw image. But in, in Lightroom, you can burn and dodge and you just take your dodging way overboard and it looks like a light. So I just burn in the little area that would be the light bulb. I mean, sorry, dodge the area that's the light bulb. And then the, the key is, so when you're doing Photoshop, you also have to think, what would the light naturally do? And so the first thing that you do is you make a bulb. So you dodge a bulb. And you literally have to turn all of the sliders up to like 100%. And you dodge out a little bulb. Then you make a new brush and you dodge out what would happen on the glass, because the glass would kind of glow a little bit too. And so you dodge each panel of glass. And then that, once you've got that done, now the light's gonna spill. And so you create another brush and you brush in warmth and brightness where it would be hitting the wall. So you're brushing in the wall to make the wall a little bit brighter. And then your fourth is back here in the window. You see that little glow of warmth in the window in the back? That's not there, but I knew it would be there if the light was there, it would be hitting the glass. And so I just brush in a little bit of bright and orange into that area and I sold the, it looks real, right? Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. So here's the original. So, and, I, and uh, like I can show you, here, I'll, I'll actually, I'm going to go into the develop module right now, and I'm going to turn off the brush. Mm. So hang on one second. Did you do Photoshop? What's that? Did you do Photoshop? No, this is all in Lightroom. Yeah. So hang on one second. Let me find my... Yeah. Okay, see that? Yeah. So that's with the brush off. 
and then turning the brush on. So it's just, but you can see, see how the window disappears, the light, the little sparkle in there disappears simply because, and I think this is a good example. I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend or waste a lot of time on it in a lighting class, except that you, the more you can start thinking about the way light naturally happens and, and the things it's saying and doing, um, the better you'll be at every aspect of photography. So as you're walking around, you can be practicing by just looking at lights as you, uh, like for instance, uh, when it rains here in New York, you guys have amazingly beautiful streets because there's so many lights and then, the, then you've got little cobblestones in places and you've got uh, you know, the, all the shimmering light coming off of it. And then you've got people walking in front of it that create these forward shadows that creates all this. So then you've got sparkling stuff coming off of the sidewalk because of the rain and the lights up above. But then you've got shadows that are interrupting that because the people walking in front of you are blocking the light that's coming towards you. And so you've got all this volume. Watch Pay attention to that when you're walking around and realize what light does. How does it reflect off things? What angles does it take? Because all of that is educational to figure out how to sell your story in light. Because again, we're just, we're just telling stories and we're, it's all about the words we use to sell those stories, to tell people the story. Um, a lot of it has to do with your ability to modify the light. So there's a difference between just adding light to a subject. For instance, here's, here's a great example of this. Um, this is why I do things off the cuff, because I think of random things and I want to show it. So, OK, here. So we've got a model in front of a door. I like the way the door looks. It's a cool looking door. She's a beautiful model. I'm excited about it. And I take a light, and I put it over to the right hand si or to the left hand side. And I don't have to follow any kind of light, because I'm in the shade of a building. I can do whatever I want. I can create my own light. And so I could just do, if I just took it without any light whatsoever, I would just have a flatly lit thing. The door wouldn't have any texture to it because the light would be coming from right behind me. So it would be a flat door with no texture to it, no shadows, and she would be flatly lit so there would be no shape to her because all of the light would be coming straight from where the camera is towards that door. So I decide, okay, I'm going to darken down my normal exposure, my ambient, and I'm going to use the light to create the volume. So I use the light to create volume on her, and it's spilling onto this door and creating volume there. Okay, so I've got directional light. It's creating volume, but the photograph is about the door. And I want the photograph to be about the door. And so if all I... Excuse me, if all I use is just a softbox, just without this grid on it, just a softbox, it spreads. Light spreads. It goes like this, and it's hitting that door. But if I change the situation and I use grids and I use snoots, then I get that. And I like that story better because now, yes, the door is there, but it's a much more mysterious door, right? It's got that, it's, it's got more. It's got more um, shadows on it. It's got more texture to it. But it's that way because I'm using grids and snoots. Does anyone know what a snoot is? It looks like this. OK, snoot. So it, it directs the light so that it doesn't go like this. It actually goes like this. And a grid. Does everybody know what a grid is? What are those? A grid is just a honeycomb. Well, I've got one on the softbox. But you can also use grids on just a head. And so I can take a grid and put it on a head. And we will have, um, what's that? Oh, it's up there, there, right there. See that grid? Right there. So that grid up in the top, yeah, just turn on that modeling light and they'll see that grid. So these grids help direct the light so that it's not going to hit me until I get in front of the grid, which means that our door doesn't get spill light. Our door doesn't get all the light that we don't want. We want the light to go in one specific direction. But I also notice that the shadows on our face get deeper because the light doesn't travel around. It doesn't bleed around the side of our face. It only goes in the direction that we choose. 
So grids and snoots and barn doors, those types of things help to direct our light so that we can avoid light going where we don't want it to go. And I think that's really important when you're trying to sell a story that your light is doing what you intend it to do and not what you don't intend it to do. And that's the difference between just adding light and what we call shaping light. You can just add light or you can shape your light. And if you just add it, it just goes wherever. So how many of you have a, an on-camera flash? Yeah? Okay, so a lot of people, when they're doing a wedding, they'll photograph like this and they'll just grab their on-camera flash and instead of going forward because they've been told that that's ugly light, forward light is ugly light and it flattens things out and it's really harsh and, <laughs> and so they go like this and they bounce it. And they'll bounce it just right off of that wall and so then they get directional light, which is quite nice, right? Or they'll, they'll go up on the ceiling and then they got natural light falling down here, it's directional from above. And if they go kind of halfway in between like that, then they get kind of light spilling in this way, which almost feels a little bit like sunlight or a window light or something like that. So all of that's really great, but they're just adding light. So they, the whole room starts to feel exactly the same because they're just adding light to the room. The difference then is adding or shaping, and this is really, like, when you look at the difference between this, that's adding light to a scene, and that's shaping light into a scene. So there's a big difference. Um, so, I, I also photograph a lot of senior portraits, and uh, I wanted to show you this senior portrait. Um, this is a great example of something outdoors. How many of you shoot outdoors quite a bit? Does anybody shoot portraits outdoors, that kind of stuff? No? Yes? A couple? Okay. So I've got a lot of shaking their heads. So, so those of you who don't shoot portraits outdoors, what do you shoot? Just uh, shout out what you shoot, just so I know. I Street photography? Home photos. Home, home. Like babies and stuff? Babies or? and pregnant women. Okay, babies and pregnant women in their home. Excellent. So, so in your instance, you go into a home, you could just pound light into a ceiling and you would be adding light. So the whole room looks a little brighter. But now, how do you shape that light to make it your specific story? How do you direct attention to one specific area? That's what we're talking about, is shaping that light. So uh, what else do you guys shoot? Wedding. Weddings. Okay, weddings. Fashion. What's that? Fashion, all right. Anybody else? What do you, what do you shoot? Landscape. landscape, okay. So there are no flashes that are big enough to light your landscape, but the concepts are still the same. What is that light saying and doing? It's gotta do both. If it's just doing something, it's not worth it. It's gotta be saying something as well. The light's gotta be directing you down a path. It's gotta be pushing you down to this specific tree or that specific road has to be leading you somewhere to a light source that's calling to you. That's, what, that's what's got to happen with your landscape photography. Because uh, landscape photography that just has light is very boring. It's got to be saying something. That light's got to be screaming out. It's got to be singing like angels. Okay, so this one specifically, outdoor uh, portrait, if you look at the natural scene, that's what it looks like. So I'm in the tree cover, and by the way, Arizona also has mountains and trees. Um, we are in the desert, but two hours, and I've got that. And so I've got my couple, and they are in the trees, and this is what it looks like. Now, that's pretty ugly. And you could expose correctly. Obviously, I'm not exposed for them, correct? So I could expose for them, and I just did this after the fact inside of Lightroom, but this is generally what it would look like if you exposed correctly in your camera. For them, you would still have weird things on their faces, but you would also just blow out the trees, and that, well, that's not good either. So that natural light that I could get, even though in the shade, people, and, and this is an interesting I think this is something that people misunderstand who call themselves natural light photographers. Natural light photography, just because you went into the shade, does not mean it's going to be beautiful. 
because that's what it would look like in the shade. I've done my very, very best to get them out of the sun and in a pretty spot, and that's what it's going to look like. Now, you could move them forward and get rid of that crest of light on his face and stuff like that, but natural light photography does not always work just because you're in the shade. You still have to be looking for light. Light has to actually be there, um, and a direction of light has to be there in order for you to get something more like that. Now that's just the addition of light in a natural light situation. So I'm exposing for my trees, I'm exposing for that general you know, foliage and the beauty of what's in there, but I'm not dependent on the natural light to create the natural light on them. I'm simply taking the flashes and put them where the sun would come from. Because the sun is coming from through these trees that, that way. It's up there. It's up to the right. Above their head and to the right. And so what do I do? I create that natural light with flashes that are naturally made in Sweden by natural people. <laughs> so this is naturally occurring light because it's all natural occurring elements that have been fashioned into amazing light shaping tools and then created with natural elements that are put into batteries that create flashes. So it's all naturally occurring, it's just that we harnessed it into one amazing tool. So what we've done then, see this right here? What is that? That's my softbox. <laughs> That's my softbox right here. So I am lighting them with a softbox, this softbox, and it's all coming down like this because the light would be up there. And I'm sneaking it around. I'm just, I'm cheating. I'm always cheating. I start where the sun would be. So if the sun is going to be here, and let's say they're standing right there and the sun is right back there, I'm taking that light and I'm sneaking it around to like right there. As, as much as I can get it around without it looking like I just, you know, went like that, right? So I'm putting it as close to the front as I can without going around to the front. I'm sneaking it around till it creeps around and hits them. But notice that it still creates a shadow here between her elbow and his elbow because the sun would create a shadow there anyway. Then I have to do something with the hair because they're gonna fall into the background. He's gonna kind of blend into the trees back there and she might blend into the sparkles of the trees back there. And so I want a hair light. So then I just simply take a bare head and put it a little bit behind him and face forward, and that's creating that hair light, okay? Remember, this is what the original scene looks like. That's nothing, no light. And then this is what the full light looks like, the whole full scene looks like, okay? So it seems natural, it seems like it could work, but there's no way that happens. Now. This next one, same couple, same situation. Um, notice that I, I've got them sitting down and see these horrible like hot spots and then deep, deep shadows. Okay, in this circumstance, I wanted like a dark brooding, like I wanted to all about them. So I keep it fairly dark and I'm gonna light them, but I want you to notice what I do because I want it to feel like you're under the trees. Now we do this, uh, in um, commercial photography all the time, if we want it to feel like you're under a tree, we use something, uh, uh, it's, it's called a kukulorus, and it's, it's, a, it's a big piece of plywood that you cut these random shapes into, and you put it in front of your light, and it looks like dappled light coming through a tree. We do it all the time. You can buy them for, uh, I think uh, Magmod makes kukuloruses that have like designs in them that, and then you can put them on your flashes and they'll, they'll look like a um, window coming, uh, light coming through a window that has like uh, slats on the window so that you get, so you could shape your light and create, it looks like the baby's in front of a window that has uh, slats on it, you know, and then it rakes across and it's got, and you could put like a warm gel on it and then suddenly it would look like it's like shadow light, shadow light, and it's all warm so it looks like the light's coming through a barn window or something like that. So what's the name? Uh, it's uh, Magmod makes them. And it's just, wow. yeah. Magmod makes them for flashes, but it's called a kukulorus. 
Yeah, don't ask me to spell it. Um, so a Kukulorus allows you to create those shapes. So I kind of like this, and I, I like, I've got natural occurring Kukuloruses up here. This is the tree, right? And so those are creating that shape, and I want to keep that feel. And so when I light them, notice what I do. Do you see how I leave some of that, the, the highlights and the shadows still there? So you can see the leaves still in action. You can see that the light is kind of shimmering off of them, but it just looks like they're in the shade and it looks like the sun happens to be coming right through and hitting them. Because I've left the natural flaws of the shadows in there, and the way I do that is instead of by overpowering the shadows, I dim it down so that the shadows still exist. So those shadows go away based on the power of your flash. So the brighter I make my flash, the less I would have those little shadows and shimmers on their, on their body. And, the, and, and so I dim it down until I start to see that feeling of the trees and the light hitting them. And that makes it even more realistic because now that I see actual flaw shadows, little shadows kind of, in, then it feels like, wow, they're really just in the trees and there's this light kind of striking them. But it's not. It, they would be in complete shadow with just a couple little rays of light on them. But instead, we add that little flash to kind of brighten up those shadows. But notice at no time have I ever fought the light. I've never gone from the opposite side and tried to fill in those shadows. Come from the same direction, make the light bigger, it naturally fills the shadows. We just sneak it a little bit further one way or the other. I think it appears too fake. Um, I, that doesn't mean I don't do it on occasion where I'll bring a light in and fill something. But most of the time, my lights are this way. So like, for instance, let's just say that I'm shooting here and I'm shooting all of you. And the natural light seems to suggest that we're going this way. So my main light is going to be over there. So let's say the big softbox or the big umbrella is gonna be here. Now, most people that are making photographs, especially like group family photographs or something like that, they'll put the big umbrella right here to light the group. And then they'll take another umbrella and they'll put it the same distance from them here at the same angle and they'll turn it down a stop so that they have the strong light over here, the weak light over here, and so everybody's face on this side is, you know, this X bright, and everybody's face on this side is X divided by two, right? That's how they do it. So there's, there's, a, there's still a shape. I don't do that. So I start over here with my strong light, and that's what creates the direction of light. My second light is right here next to me, and I'm right here. And that's what's filling that shadow. That's sneaking around and getting the other side. But then I still have actual shadows. I don't have competing shadows going this way. Have you ever noticed in a group photograph, if you go to a group photo, you go to any wedding photograph that you've ever seen that, that's shot with a flash, and you'll see that there's competing shadows. And the guy in the background, the, the guy that stepped like a step too far back, he's got a shadow coming from this one, and a shadow coming from this one, and his face looks this skinny. Because it's like shadow, shadow, and then he's got this like thin, tiny face that's literally, he has no ears, he has no face, and he just looks like someone just went and squished him. In my system, that doesn't happen because my main light is creating the direction, which gives him a shadow, but the secondary light is not over there, it's right here. And that's what's filling in. And so it still has the same direction of light. It's still coming from the same direction, but it goes straight in and gets past all the people in front of him and hits him. So I'll do one light and another light before I'll do one light and another light like that. Because I don't want those competing angles to happen. So the question was if I'm shooting at a window. So if this was the window, let's just say this is the window right here. Okay, so here's our window. So if this was our window and she was standing in front of the window, so go ahead and stand in front of the window like this. Yeah. Now, you want me to shoot this way? So if I'm shooting towards a window, obviously the main light source is here coming this way. 
which is brilliant because I get to choose because if it's equal, but chances are it's not. Chances are you're here and I'm shooting like this and I'm still including the window, but I'm basically shooting you at an angle and the window's kind of coming. I'm still seeing you in the window, but it's more on this side. So then this light, my light source, is going to be right here because it's going to follow that natural light that's on this side and it's going to wrap around but it's going to be around you close enough that it can go and it can hit here so you're going to have natural shadows over here which would naturally happen because the window light is coming this way but this is going to fill them in and follow that light so if you always think follow that light now if I turn this way now the bulk of the window is on this side of her face, so the light's going to be over here, and it's going to sneak around that side of your face. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, at, thank you. So at any point when you're photographing any scene, doesn't matter what scene you're photographing, all you need to do is look at your existing light. Where is the bulk of it coming from? Where is the strong light coming from? That's the direction you start immediately. That's just, it's just, okay, I see where the light's coming from and I'm going to pull it in. Now, there are instances where you want to change the light source. So you've decided, you see a scene and you decide, eh, I don't want it to come from that uh, area. I want it to come from somewhere else. Um, in that case, uh, you are actually going to, so for instance here, and I, hold on, let me make sure I have, yes, okay. So, here's the original shot. And you can see the light is naturally coming over from behind the girl, right? It's off to her right. So you've got the light coming from off to her right. This is very natural. All we have is just a small reflector over here just kind of popping a little bit of light into her, but it's not much. So it's just, it's a white reflector. It's not a silver one. It's not doing a ton of work. It's just barely filling her in a little bit. Um, and that's, that's what we can get with natural occurring light and a little bit of a reflection. So it, it works. But it's very flat. It doesn't have the drama. It doesn't say um, into the woods. It doesn't say Little Red Riding Hood going into the deep dark forest. It just doesn't feel as it's like she's got this soft bunny, she's soft, she looks cute, and I want it to be a deep, dark wood so that there's a little bit of a, a difference between the two of them. And so I do this. Now, in this case, we changed the direction of light completely. Remember, it was coming from over here. But now the light's coming from over here and it's creating a direction of light. Notice that there's a rim light on the left side of her face now. The light's coming from over there. So we've got a rim light that's, that's separating her out from the background. <coughs> so it's just a bare head. Actually, it's not a bare head. It's, a, um, it's got a grid on it so that it doesn't spill onto the trees so much. Because you can see the trees get a lot of light on them anyway. Um, but we've got a grid on it trying to push it directly towards her. And then we have a soft box that's lighting her face and giving her that little kind of Rembrandt uh, on her. Yeah, you got the little Rembrandt light going on her, um, on her cheek there on the right. And so it's softly lighting her. But notice what we had to do to the trees in the background. Okay, I'm going to go back and forth between these two shots and you have to, you have to look at this because it, is quite, um, it was quite a remarkable thing what we had to accomplish. So, you see that? See how the light is from the sun is striking the trees on the right hand side. And now, we reverse the trees. Do you see that? <laughs> so that was a lot of flashes. <laughs> So we had four B1s all the way down this, like, because they're in kind of lines. And so we had four B1s all the way down the grove, pushing light this way to make the sun come from the other direction. Because we wanted the light to come from one specific direction. Do you see how much effort it takes to change the natural direction of light? So now I have two lights on her, a, a rim light, 
and a soft box. And then I have four major B1 lights that are at full 10 power, like they're as big as they can go and they've got reflectors on them to kind of push the light that way in order to change the direction of light. I have a silly question. Wouldn't it be easier just to place her on that side? Great question. Why on earth would I go through the exercise of changing the direction of the sun when I have, I could just put her on the other side and, and that's the point. Because I teach and I want to show okay. you how much effort it takes, but I can do it. Right. And it's an amazing shot. I love the shot. And it really creates this drama but I had to create that mood by changing the direction of light. I couldn't simply just change her direction of light because if she has a different direction of light than the background, what happens? It looks fake and she pops out of it. So be careful about that too. A lot of people, I, I teach a lot of workshops and when I'm at the workshop, someone will see and they'll, they'll be like, okay, I want her over there and I want to shoot and then take their light and they'll put it over here because they want to create a short light situation where the shadow's coming from behind. And so the best place to put the light is over there and then they get ready to shoot and I'll come up to them and say, um, if you shoot it that way, she's gonna look like she's on a green screen because the background has shadows going this way and they're making shadows going that way and it looks like someone really did a bad gr screen, uh, green screen job and they'd just be like, like standing out, right? <laughs> so we, our eyes and our brain will see the difference between background and foreground based on two things. The first thing is based on the direction of light or the shadows. If those don't match, your brain will think something's wrong. The other thing that doesn't, that if, it, if the brightness doesn't match, your brain will think something's wrong and they'll pop out or they'll fall back, depending on whether they're too bright or too dark. And so if you, if you have something like an overcast day and then you really seriously brighten someone up, like watch this, this is a great example of this. So normally what would have happened in this scene is I would have, I would have planned it based on her being on the left-hand side of the frame, looking into the scene, getting the natural light coming from the right, and I would have used that natural light instead of trying to reverse the direction. But I thought it would be an interesting experiment to try and just completely change the direction of light, and it takes a lot of effort. But what I see people doing all the time is they do that every day. They're trying to change the natural direction of light and they're working three or four times as hard as they need to because they walk into a scene and then they, they see light coming from here and then they try and overpower it and come this way and change it. And it doesn't make any sense. Instead, just follow that natural direction and then I wouldn't have needed anything to show a different direction of light. However, it did help in this instance, it helps to have the lights coming through the trees because it creates a stronger direction of light than the sun was giving me in the first place. So if I would go back to the original uh, image, so in the original image, it's not quite as strong a direction, so it doesn't create quite as dramatic an effect, but I wouldn't have had to work as hard. I would have probably been able to put those same lights over you know, on the other side and follow the natural direction of light, and I probably would have at five. They probably would have needed to be at five power instead of ten in order to create that. Because I really had to overpower and start fresh and come from the other direction. So, But you can do what, the, the beauty of a flash is that you can recreate whatever you want. You can change your, um, you can change your circumstance, you can change your stars uh, and, and be whatever you want. If my math is correct, that was about a fifteen thousand dollar illusion. It was. It was a very expensive illusion. Um, so here's a really good example of following um, natural existing light, but not. It's not naturally existing light because of where the sun is. All this is in shade. But my composition is that the girl's going to be here and the the welder's going to be there. So he's making sparks, and the sparks are coming this way, so what way should the light come? 
should come from the sparks, even though it wouldn't, it's not really coming from the sparks, but we want it all, we want the direction to go that way. And so we light from over here and we're, see how we're lighting right there too? We're only doing that with a grid simply because we want his head to stand out because otherwise he just falls into the background and he just disappears. Um, and so we, we, don't, we don't want that. But I want you to show, show you the difference. Again, this is another example of shaping light. This is the final shot but the, the original shot looks like this. And now it's no longer all that interesting back there. I mean, up here, it's, it's see how there's corrugated metal, we see too much. So there's too much to look at back, back in the background because it's so bright. And so all that is is a matter of shaping light. So instead of having lights with, um, basically with uh, cups on them, so we call them uh, reflectors. They're the little cups that are silver that go like this, that direct the light in one direction. All of those have, have what we call a reflector on them. So they're all going forward, but they're still spreading. So once we put grids on all of them, so as soon as we put grids on every single one of them, then suddenly that's what it looks like. So now you've got that darkness in the background. It's only hitting his face or his head. It's only striking right there. So it's just striking the areas. It's, we've got one that's raking across this to create this dark shadow, dark shadow, you know, this light shadow, light shadow, light shadow. And you can see it's happening up here, but we want it to be dark so that the sparks are what matter not, you know, everything else in the shot. And that 100%, the difference between those, those two shots is literally the difference between do you put grids on your lights or don't you? That's it. It's all grids versus no grids. Grids versus no grids. Grids are super, super incredibly important when it comes to lighting stuff. So, um, okay. So, Let's talk about then that concept of shaping or adding light. So what we're going to do right now, um, so I have, uh, it's Randy, right? Chris. Randy is my model. I actually brought him in from California. He's Texas, Texas so he's my <laughs> Texas model. And he's going to come forward. We're going to take a picture of him. And uh, before we do that, I'm going to start turning on some lights, and I'm going to put this uh, into our uh, shooting mode so that we can see. All right, so we should be able to see. Let me just take a test fire here and make sure that this is actually tethering, so. Uh, hold on, there we go. And there we go, it's coming in now, so you, I'm gonna, there we go. Okay, so that's what we've got right now. That's our naturally existing light. It's very beautiful. Um, so obviously we don't have any good light coming in right now. Um, we just have the light that's happening to us right now. In this case, we don't care about the naturally existing light. This is like my studio. It doesn't matter. All I have is, you know, lights up on the ceilings or whatever. So I don't care about that because... Yeah, I'm gonna keep it on because remember, if I'm at 100 ISO at 200th of a second at say uh, f 3.5, this is this is what I get with an exposure. Oh, come on. This is what I get with an exposure if my camera would stop being busy. I'll tell you what, I hate tethering. Oh, there we go. Sometimes turning off and turning back on will do the trick. So let's try that. Well, that's perfect. There we go. Got it. So the naturally occurring light here in the room is going to give me a very dark shot with nothing in there. So the light's going to overpower it. So I can do whatever I want. Um, so we're not going to talk about the idea in here of trying to overcome or deal with c existing light source. We can do whatever we want. What we want to talk about is the idea of shaping light versus just adding light. So in this case, if I were just to take my flash and turn it on, so I'm just going to turn this flash on, and I was just to throw light onto the scene, I'm going to get a very unpleasing light. Come on forward, Randy.
So right now, all I've got, um, turn that off for now, because I'm just gonna use this on camera. So I'm just using an on camera light, and I'm just gonna get a flat light source. Now, the, the A1 is quite nice for, it's probably the nicest on camera light I've ever seen, because it's round and it's got this beautiful fall off. So it's very different than all the other on camera flashes that you might have seen. Um, but it's still flattening out the subject because it's on the camera. It's coming straight for Randy. So when I take a picture of Randy, um, I'm just gonna get this flat light coming towards him. Do you see that? So it's just a flat light source. That's all it is. And um, right now that it's in TTL and it's trying to take all of that gray and it did a good job at making it 18% gray, don't you think? Like it saw all that white and it's like, I'm gonna make that 18% gray. So it's dead on accurate in making it all 18% gray. So I just want to uh, increase it. I'm gonna go to like, there. So the next shot that comes in is gonna have a photo of Randy and it's, we've, we've successfully added light. Come on in, come on in, come on in. Well, did we successfully add light? Come on. Well, I'm gonna take another one, Randy, just in case the tethering. No camera detected. Tell you what, tethering's got a long way to go, my friends. It's absolutely surprising how bad tethering is. Well, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna waste our time on this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you all that picture. Can you zoom in on a camera, you think? Yeah. Okay, so I have added light. So it's just flat. I just added flat light to Randy. So he's no longer in the dark, but we've just added light. Well, that's good for maybe evidentiary photography where I just need to see what Randy looks like and I need to then show that he's committed a crime and I need to put him up on a wall at the post office so that you can find him the next time you see him. That would work. But if I want to make Randy look cool, then I've got to do something different than that, and that's where the light shaping comes in. Now, if I add too much light to the scene without shaping it, I'm gonna have, notice that that shot was fairly equal, his face and the background were fairly equal. There wasn't a lot of difference between them because the light's going forward, he's close enough to the background that the light's reflecting forward, so we're just getting kind of everything equal. Right? It was a lot like the trees and the little child. Um, and so that's a problem. We want to shape the light, and that's why we start using things like soft boxes instead of bare heads. And that's why we start from a direction. Instead of using an on-camera flash, we'll either take the flash and bounce it off a wall so that it comes from over here and then it comes in on him. Or if we have the option, which we do here, um, I can actually turn this head off so I'm actually turning the head off, but it's still gonna be a controller. So my A1 works as a controller to all of the other flashes. So now I can tell it I want to work with that flash. So this is gonna be considered our A flash. So we've set this as the A group. And then the flashback here that you see up there that has that little tiny grid on it, that's gonna be, what's that? Which one's that one? That one is also a B2. So we have, the B2 is a, is a power box like this. Do you see that? It's just a power box and it's got two light sources that can be connected to it. And you can, you can tell them to be A through F. So you can choose what group they're gonna be on. And each one can be on a different group. And I'll just set it that way so you can see it. So there's A, this is the A light. And then that one's the C light. And I set my groups up so that I can remember which ones are which. So A is always the light that's the main light. So that's the light that's on the person. B light is always the light that lights the background. So if I have a light on the background, it's gonna be a B light. And then my C light is always the one that comes towards the camera. You see how I'm using C and B? So I always know if it's pointing towards the camera, it's the C light. 
If it's pointing at the background, it's the B light. And if it's pointing at my person, it's the A light. That way when I'm talking to an assistant or I'm changing things here, I can be like, okay, I know that that's the A light. Because otherwise I get all changed around. I can't remember which one is that and I have to go look at it and it's, I waste a lot of time doing that. So I've just come up with that as my way of talking to myself about what I'm doing. All right, so, so at this point I'm going to light and you are tall. I am tall. You're very tall. Um, that is very, t okay. So I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be the short photographer photographing the tall uh, criminal. <clears throat> okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull this light up front here, and I want to light him in a very dramatic way, because I love, I love the glasses, I love the way the glasses look, I love the hat, I, I, I like the fact that he's scruffy, so he's got some beard going on there. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna create drama. Now if I was shooting a woman and I wanted to kind of remove wrinkles and make her softer, then I'm not gonna use this grid. But the grid works really well for a man or someone who you want to be very dramatic or whatever, or, or an old lady who doesn't mind being old. That's good too. You know, like so, someone who doesn't mind their wrinkles, they see it as a badge of honor, then a grid's a great thing for them um, because it keeps the, the softbox from filling in its own shadows. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a direction of light. But the other reason that the grid is important is that I want that background to go dark. I don't want it to be a light, bright thing. I want it to go dark so that it's almost black, maybe a gray, like a dark gray. And so by using a grid, this can't spill onto my background. It can only go that way. And that's how we're going to, ooh, nice. Look at that. Yes. That's strong, too. That's nice. I like that. OK, very good. All right. so. So this right here, the closer we get it to him, the softer it's going to be. Plus, I'm going to have much better power as a result of it, so I don't have to waste as much batteries. So the closer I can get it, the better off I am. So I'm going to put it right to the edge of him. I want it to go as much that way as I can so that it's not hitting the background. And then that light back there is what's going to separate him from the darkness because we have to create something, because his, his hat is black, and I want that background to be pretty gray, and if I make it gray enough or dark enough, his hat will just disappear. That's why we need that grid on that head back there. And the reason we don't have that head just spraying light without a grid is because it goes almost in 180 degrees, and so where is it gonna hit? It's gonna hit my lens, and it's also gonna hit that background. So I don't want that to happen. All right, so now we're gonna take a picture. Well, yeah, why don't you go right up here, and then I'm gonna move this to right, like that. Very good. Okay, so the beauty of this is that I'm gonna, this little switch right here, by the way. This, I, okay, I just have to, who knows about the A1? This A1 is awesome. So the A1 is the on-camera version of all of the ProPhoto system. So it is a studio flash that fits on your camera, but it's also a controller. So instead of using a little controller like this, I can simply put the A1 on there and I have a flash and this all together. And it's controlling any of these and I can control in manual or TTL. So if I turn this into TTL like that, I just flip the switch up, it's gonna talk to these other flashes, it's gonna figure out the power, and it's going to deliver what it thinks would be the right power. Yeah? What is TTL? TTL is through the lens. So it's metering through the lens, it's doing a pre-flash, it's deciding what the exposure should be, and then it's delivering a message back to all the flashes and saying, go ahead and be at X power. So let's say five. So it says, I think you need five power for this shot. So it tells everybody to be at five power. Then, if you decide, eh, that's too powerful, you can then dial it down by doing a flash compensation. And at that point, it says, okay, do my calculation minus a stop. All right, so that's what's gonna happen right now. Remember, this flash is off, this flash is on, and that flash is on. And it's gonna do the computation on its own. And we've gridded them so that the background is not going to be very well lit. Can you take that and move it? Like, move it 
uh, way over here. Yeah, there we go. Okay, you ready? Yep. Okay, so serious. Yeah, there you go. That's all I do. That's all you do is serious. That's your gig. Okay, so uh, you will notice that it is way too bright. Mm -hmm. oh. And that's because I have... Uh, <laughs> it's uh, way too bright, that's why. Okay. Let's try it again, give it a chance to... There we go. Okay, so it just fired too bright because it was the first fire I've done and so it, was, it went nuts. Can everybody see that? I wish I had my... You can zoom. You want can to you zoom in? You want to try to zoom in? You got it? Yeah. Okay, so I want you to see that and see how it's it, what we call a cross-lit situation. So it's cross-lit um, and, and it's quite dramatic. I, I like it. Do you like it? That's pretty cool. Yeah. But his hat is falling into the background a little bit too much. So I don't have a rim light on him the way I want it. So I need to turn that rim light up. Now remember, I know that that light is C. So I'm going to go into my C. Oh, you know why it's not? It's off. I turned it off. So I didn't even have it on. So I'm going to turn my C light on. And now I'm going to take the picture. <laughs> I was like, that, that really did not do well. OK, you ready? OK, I love the series. OK, better, but it needs to be turned up. So I'm going to take my C light, and I'm going to turn it up. Do you see, if you look over here, you can see the power going up and down on that flash. Do you see it? Yeah. I'm controlling it with my thumb right now. So I'm going to turn that thing up a stop and a half from where it is currently. And then I'm going to fire it again. Nope, no, no, nope. no. There, no, no. got it? Got it. All right. Okay, I know where to get it fixed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you ready? Here we go. There we go. So now I even want it a little bit more. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go crazy and go up to two. Nice. Okay, so now I'm going to hold it still so you can zoom in on this. But now you can see that I've got that nice rim on his hat that's coming through and that rim on his shoulder. So it's separating him from the background. I'm going to, there you go. Good. Yes, good, good, good. Everybody see? Mm -hmm. All right. Do you, do you have it back there? You're good? Okay. So do you see that? Sorry about the uh, tethering situation. It just didn't work. Oh, the flash does it? It's bizarre. It's, it's, it's electronics. What do you want? That's right. Electronics is like a mystical religion. Okay, so, um, so now if I like what I've got and I want to start playing with it, then I just simply turn this from TTL to manual. So now everything's stuck where it is, and now I can just finesse stuff up and down based on how much I like, right? And I can, I can play with my exposures. Now, I promised those of you that shoot Nikon. How many of you shoot Nikon? Okay, great. I promised a, uh, something special for you. So I shoot Canon, and I wish that my Canon did what your Nikon does. So your Nikon, when you take a picture and you show the histogram, you know that view that has the, the RGB histograms? Yeah. When you zoom in to, say, a particular side of a face, if you show just that little area, like zoom in at three, four, five hundred percent or whatever, the histogram shows you what's in that area. So you can actually do perfectly accurate RGB metering from your camera after you take the picture. I can't do that. I know, right? So, so what I have to do is this. I come in like this and I take a picture like that and then I have to look at my histogram after the fact and I go, oh, okay, that's, that's about right, but it probably needs to be a little bit brighter. I have to make some educated guesses, but I have to walk in and zoom. You literally can take whatever photo you just took and zoom in and the histogram will show you what it's showing you right now. So use that and make sure that your histogram is right because you can't trust the actual screen. 
the screen is going to lie to you all the time. It'll be too bright, it'll look like it's, and then you'll get it into the Lightroom and it'll be a stop too dark and you'll have wasted all of that beautiful light space up there on the top of your histogram. So, what I know now is that both of these lights need to come up because I'm a little bit dark based on my histogram. I was close, but it was a little bit dark. So now I can just simply take my A light up and I'm just powering it up maybe a three quarters of a stop. And then I'm gonna take my C light and I'm gonna power that one up three quarters of a stop. So now everything's just come up a little bit, right? So now I'm gonna go ahead and photograph. So we're gonna do some real photographs here, but before I do that, the one thing I've noticed about the shot is that it's all this way and there's just a little bit of light here. And of course, that's because of the grid. The grid is sending everything straight. And so this little area of light is not coming around this way. It's not going this way, it's going that way. So what I need to do is I just need to bring this around just a little bit like that. Just so that it's pointing a little bit more his direction. But remember, I don't want to point there. I don't want to hit there. Okay, so I'm just trying my hardest not to point there. Sometimes, it's my favorite thing to do with a softbox. If you take a softbox and instead of having it straight up and down, just tilt it like that. So now it kind of sneaks around that side of his face a little bit. So you get this little corner here is kind of going a little bit more around that way. A grid, it doesn't help it as much because obviously it's going straight. Um, but most of, most of my softboxes are always at an angle like that. They're not straight up and down. Yeah? Can you have the feel like you have basically the same side that you have a C-light? Yes. Oh, and, that, and I'm glad you noticed that because we don't put the hair light on the opposite side of the main light because if light is coming from the right, it all comes from the right. So if the sun was coming from the right and hitting him on the, the shoulder and on the hat, then it stands to reason that the bright part of the sky should also be lighting him from over here. So all of my lights, even my hair lights, all start from the same side. It's very rare when I put a light over on the, right, on the left hand side when all of my direction is coming from the right. So almost always, it's an asymmetrical lighting situation. I very rarely write light equally from both sides. You ready? All right, here we go. This is it. This is for your portfolio, your acting portfolio. Turn slightly this way. This way, right there. And now look at me, there you go. Love it. That's great. Okay, so I'm going to show it to you. Eric, I mean, uh, sorry. Jared. Jared. Eric from uh, Canon said if you remove the battery, put it back in, uh, and then do the tether, it should work. Really? That's, That's what, the key? That's what he... Okay. Eric Stoner. That's so here, Eric Stoner. I just removed my battery. <laughs> I'm putting it back in, and we're going to re-tether. Hopefully, we will be on. It's Electronics. Love it. Okay, hang on, let me just click this in so that the tether doesn't fall out. All right, are you ready? Let's see, yeah, it's seeing me. All right, here we go. You ready for this? Here we go. We should get something coming up on the screen now. Nice, that's pretty, I like it. And let's see if it's coming in. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Bring it in, bring it in. Okay, well what I'm going to do instead is I'm just going to go like this. I'm giving up on the tether and I'm going to... He just sent me, it's no guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell Eric, thanks, Eric. Oh yeah, I'm going to send it back and thanks. That's thanks. Exactly. Thanks for at least the try. So I, what I'm going to do, thank you. Sure. Um, I love the last one we just shot, so I'm pretty excited about that. So here we go. I'm going to show you my screen here and we are going to bring in that image just so you can see what we've been working on because I want you to to understand and see what we've accomplished here so um, yeah we will all right Okay, those are importing. 
I'm just going to move this out of the way so you can see. All right. So, so you see how we've got that dark background now? It's kind of a dark gray. That's simply because we weren't allowing our light to spill. Whereas when we first photographed them, you saw the scene and it was just gray, right? It was all equal. And that's because we just added light. Adding light is not what you're attempting to do when you're photographing. You're attempting to sculpt. You're a sculptor, but you're creating volume through light as opposed to creating volume through chisels and rocks and things like that. And the way you do that is by sculpting or shaping your light. And so you can see that we've got great light coming across here and then that little kind of Rembrandt corner that's happening right there. And now we can do whatever we want with it because we have the data. We can make it brighter or darker, or play with it or whatever we want to do, but we have that shape of light. Notice that this hat and this rim here, all of that is coming from our gridded B2 in the background coming towards the, the camera. That's what creates the depth in the photograph is that light coming towards the camera. So when you're thinking about your lighting, whether it's landscape or whatever, think about depth comes from light coming towards the camera. Without it, everything's flat. The more the light comes around to the front, the flatter the image is. The more we have light coming around to the side or the background, that's when things get deep and we get more volume to the shot. But I'm, everything is lit from one side coming around. So even when we're shooting our own stuff and we're creating our own scene, where we don't have to follow any light rules because we came into a scene that's dark and we're just creating our own. We still follow that same concept where we start with light in one direction and we follow it. The, uh, the A1 and the B2 and the, and the B1 are my, those are the three flashes that I use and they make it easy to do that because I can simply control everything from the A1. Now if I wanted it a little extra light on this all I would have had to do is turn on my A1, and, and if I were doing that, by the way, I have two options. I was shooting vertically, right? If I turn on this flash, I can either shoot this way, the light's coming from the right side of the, the frame, or I can shoot this way, and it's coming from the left. If I shoot this way, it's going to start competing with this. If I shoot this way, it's going to follow that natural direction and fill in in the same way that, so if I, I'm very conscious of which side my light comes from, especially if I start using a modifier like this one. So if I'm in a, an event and I put a modifier on like that, look how far away the light source is from the lens. It's a long way away from the lens, so it creates quite a direction, especially if I do something like that, where it's coming this way. So then I, it depends, if I'm on this way, it's coming from over here. So if I was in a situation where there was a bride and a groom and there's a window on the right-hand side, I'm gonna shoot this way, not this way, because this way I'm just fighting that natural light and I'm gonna have two light sources coming on the bride and groom. This way I have one light source and then this one looks like it's part of that one. So I, every, everywhere I go I'm trying to extend the natural light source that already exists and mimic it at all costs. I'm always trying to mimic the natural light source. I'm never trying to fight it. And it doesn't matter, it doesn't necessarily matter if it's a a big soft box like that or whether it's a small light source, it doesn't really matter because in the end, like for instance, uh, when I'm on the edge of the Grand Canyon, the wind is blowing usually 20, 10, 15 miles an hour, something like that, but then we have gusts of 50 miles an hour as the sun goes down because the, the temperatures change. And so you'll just get this whoosh and it'll send my assistant off the cliff if he's holding a two by three softbox. And so most of the time we just use a bare head because my assistant's not gonna get blown off the cliff while he's holding that, that light. Or I can set it on a stand all by itself and it's not gonna blow over, um, whereas the softbox it will. And so, but that's how I'm lighting stuff like this. So I've got a really hard light source 
hitting these guys, which is the sun. But I have to fill the other side of their face. And the way I'm doing that is with one bare head. And it's just simply photo, it's just, see, see that? He's got a sun and then he's got a light. He's got one light, it's me, and one's the sun. So we've got two light sources in there and I'm just filling in, but I'm doing it from the left hand side. So it doesn't matter whether you're using a big soft box or whether you're using one bare head. It could just be a, a, another A1. So I've got, um, when I'm shooting a, a reception or a wedding or something like that, I've got A1s all over the place. So I've got like this photograph here. here here's my assistant. So she just carries the A1 like a gun. She's very happy. <laughs> yeah. So she carries that A1, and it's got a, a really soft little dome on it like this, so it helps to kind of spread and make that light even softer. And she just carries it around, and, and she walks around as a, at a 45. So I have an A1 on my camera, and then she has an A1 in her hand. And the two of us, she just wanders around and wherever I am, she's at a 45 degree behind whatever I'm pointing at. And she just goes <laughs> like that. And she follows it, she watches me and whatever I'm pointing at, she goes over there and she points at it from the back. And this is how we get this shot right there. So that is because, see how he's got that short light on him and that beautiful light coming forward across his face? It's creating that drama and that beauty to the shot because she is the main light source. I am the weak light source. And if you can learn one thing from this lesson other than following no natural light sources, the other thing that I would teach you is that any, cam any flash, that's the closer the flash is to your camera, the weaker the light source needs to be. So my flash is always the weakest light source. My A flash is always weaker. My on-camera flash is always weaker than whatever else is on the side or behind it. So if you want volume in your shots and you want sculpture instead of flat light, instead of two dimensions, you want three dimensions, then you need to put all of your strong lights back in the background coming forward and on the side coming sideways. Your weakest light always is the forward light. And especially when it's on camera. So I'm gonna show you a shot that I took here in New York City, um, just so that you can see what I'm talking about. So um, here is my friends that we were traveling with. Oh shoot. Hold on. Okay. There's my friends. We were just traveling around, right? And we were seeing the sights. This is with a flash. See that? It's not bad because it's weak. It's not strong. I'm not trying to overpower them. I'm just trying to add a little bit to their face. Now watch this. This is the original. This is my wife, Danielle. And we were walking down the street and I saw that beautiful light in the background. Where's the light coming from? It's coming from the right hand side, right? I don't need assistance for the shot. I don't need, all I need to do is simply add one light to this shot. And do you see the difference between this shot and that shot? It's, so it's me, it's this. So take the picture, that's it. So the light is not on the camera, but it's right here. It's just off to the side of the camera. But notice that it's coming from the same direction of the light. It's coming from right over here. You can do that with a little stand and an and a A1. That's it. So this shot was accomplished with this. Where are you pointing the light direction of the face? There. Just like, well, like that. That's it. So this triggers this. This right here is what changes the difference between that and that. It's like Photoshop happened, it's lighting, it's sculpting, it, it, everything happened to that shot based on one thing and it was light. 
coming into a natural light situation, which is, is actually quite a nice situation because the sun is coming down the street and creating volume, but the problem is that the, in the shadow of her own face, then that part of the shot, she's just, she's just kind of in a bland shadow. There's nothing good about it. And we just add a little light, yeah. In the second shot, what uh, fractional lighting do you have on that flash, like her face? Oh, oh, what's the, all it is is TTL. Whatever, whatever TTL did, it just did it. Oh, yeah. That's it, that's, so literally, that's it. It's one shot, done. So it, there was no computation on my part. No, it was just, hey, honey, stand there. And I took this picture first, and I went, wow, it looks so beautiful. Okay, I turned off the flash, took another one. That was it. That's the, that's the sum total of that photo shoot. So it doesn't take a lot of brain power, especially when you're dealing with something that's as, as well done as the, as the Profoto A1 and the, and the Profoto system, because the TTL actually works incredibly well. It's a very good TTL, it's very intelligent. And so it doesn't take intelligence to get the exposures correct. It's pretty quick. The thing that it takes is an understanding of where the light should be. And that's where most people fail, is that they've got this great, these great systems that work, but they don't know where to put the light. And if you'll think about where light comes from and what it naturally does, you'll make better decisions about where your light should be and where you should put your light to help fill in those problems. Because in the end, you're trying to do three different things with your lights. So you are trying um, to, A, you want to simplify what you're doing. Because no one wants equipment getting in their way. So you've got to simplify your light situation. You want to build depth into the story that you're telling and you want to solve the problems that are there in the natural light. And those three things are best accomplished if you'll just follow the natural light that already exists. You won't spend as much time, it's much simpler. You'll get that depth that's already there because you're seeing it as a photographer. You already see good light. Now it's just a matter of working with the light instead of combating it. And then third, you're going to solve those little shadow problems that you have because you're following that natural light. So don't work harder, just work smarter. And if, you're, if you work smarter like I am, then you're going to have a lot more fun with the photographs that you're taking. So those of you who don't shoot flash or haven't shot flash, don't be afraid of it. Especially with great TTL like the A1 has, it's very easy to play with it. And it is, as long as you understand where the light's coming from and you follow that light source, it's actually a fairly easy process to make pretty incredible photographs. Yeah? I keep thinking about color temperature. So if you're merging natural light that has a particular color temperature and you're augmenting it with flash, how do, do you think about those? That's a great point. That's a great question. So, um, and, and before we finish with some question and answer here, um, I just wanted to, uh, A, thank Profoto for having me here. Um, I, I seriously can't say enough amazing things about their equipment. It's just, it's great light, it's beautifully done, it's consistent, it's accurate, it always works. Um, which is not what my experience was, you know, 10 years ago. And it was a horrible experience trying to light stuff. So um, it's, it's, it's blissful to work with their equipment. And also, thank you to B&H for having us here, too, because it's, it's pretty incredible that B&H goes through this effort to educate people for free um, across the world and in their, in their store. And it's such a fantastic store. It's just fun to be here. <laughs> I just, after this, I'll wander around for an hour and a half just looking. It's like, it's like Disneyland here. Um, if, uh, if you want to find me um, and find out where I'm going to be next, that's the easiest place to go is jaredplatt.com forward slash events. Um, and also, you can find me on Facebook at Jared Platt and Twitter and Instagram, all Jared Platt. That's it. So it's very easy to find me. Just Google Jared Platt. You'll find me. There is a wrestler that died a couple years ago. Um, it's not me, I'm not a wrestler, and I haven't died. So those two things will get you to the right Jared Platt. So, um, but I wanna thank everybody for having us here, and we can answer some questions now. So uh, your question, go. Yeah.